Okay, so let's see. I want to see if I'm recording or not. Okay, so now we are recording. That's good. Uh, so. Yeah. I don't know what's, what's going on with this. It can't be that. Like, yeah, that should be fun. Yeah. Okay, so now, um, what will we hope to today? We have to finish the proof of uh, spiritual skill, right? So we will do that today. So today, so we finish proof of spiritual skill. So remember our setting was like this. So this is, okay, our setting was like this. We fixed uh, two positive integers A and M relatively fine. And then uh, we wanted to show that actually, uh, and then we, we, okay, so before that we considered this arithmetic progression a plus kn, k from zero to infinity, and we denoted by pa a set of prime, which is in the, in the progression, right? The primes in progression. A plus K. So primes of the form A plus K, right? And our goal was uh, to show that um, limit of sum one over P to the S, P belonging to P A, divided by log of one over S minus one as S goes to plus, okay, is equal to one. The, this quantity goes to infinity, it's goes to one. But it shows that uh, this limit is also infinite. So in particular, right, sum, one over P, P belonging to T A, and S is equal to one, is actually uh, infinite. As we think of this one, so this is infinite. In particular, <laughs> the corollary of this corollary is that there are infinite primes in this arithmetic, right? There exist infinite primes in uh, the progression this is the of course generalization of uh, Euler's proof of Euclid's theorem that there are infinite primes in the progression one two this is we saw that started the lectures by calling Euclid's proof and then we saw that Euler gave a new proof and then uh, now, this is a generalization, vast generalization of all of those uh, by Lirichley, and we want to. But this quantity is, uh, is uh, 
Oh, this is a mistake, by the way. Sorry. Over 5n. Oh, my God. It's going to show that the Dirich Lake density of primes in the production is 1 over 5. So this is Dirich Lake density. Sorry about that. Um, I also mentioned that it would be nice to prove to say that ratio of primes started with progression compared to pro all primes to some limit as that limit goes to infinity. But that would be also a, another density measure that would be called the natural density. But that density we cannot prove. This is what uh, we can prove using these methods. And that's, uh, so uh, so I'll, I'll discuss that a little after, after we do the boundary. So now um, for the proof, we consider two functions. So recall, I defined two functions. One uh, was uh, for any character pi in that I define this function as pi of s to be equal to, I believe, because sum of pi p over p s. P p s, p belongs to p a. It's like a quantity that we want here, but uh, we just uh, moderated by this character. So this is, so this is the this is the first uh, thing that uh, we studied in the last uh, lecture, and we proved two facts about these things. Right, one of them was that pi is chi zero is the trivial character. So that if this guy is a trivial character. Then uh, we saw that uh, this is almost like uh, it makes like uh, sum over one over p to the s for all primes. In other words, as s goes to one, it behaves like uh, log of one over s minus one. I think that we obtained studying the behavior of the zeta function. I'm using uh, the Euler product form. So if chi is trivial character, then if chi s is asymptotic to log of one over s minus one. And the reason for this was very simple because we saw that actually the difference between in, the, in this case, chi is the trivial character between this guy and summing over all primes is just summing over primes which divide n. Those remain. So the primes that divide n is a finite number of primes divide n. And then for that, of course, I showed that, uh, I have already showed that summing over all primes is as as s goes to one. That's one thing right? The second thing was also, If chi is a non trivial character, it's very important. Non trivial. Then we saw that these guys remain bounded as s goes to one. So they, they sort of remain bounded. Then basically, um, Try and remain bound. As as goes to no, plus. So for non-trivial uh, characters, they have nice behavior. They are bounded as a for, for trivial character, but they sort of mimic zeta function. 
uh, sum over all primes, uh, and we know that sum over all primes behaves like uh, blah, 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 very small. Okay, so these are the things that we put last lecture. Uh, now let's, we also put, yeah, we put more. We have put everything we need. I'll just recall. Question? Yes. 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 Right, so so uh, in the case of the trivial character, chi equal to chi zero, you have sum one over q to the s, right? Uh, going to pa. Now, what what is pa? Pa is um, is, is 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 a set of primes of the form. A plus A. So we divide this prime into two, two categories. Those that divide N, and those that don't divide N. So in this case, uh, these things cannot divide N. So we are summing over our prime. So what is left, so I'm going to add to this. So this is my F chi zero of S, right? So what we did, we added to this. Sum of primes. That key divides S. Uh, minus those primes S that uh, again divide yeah. we added and subtracted now once you want to look at this I say this is the set of all primes But if you can um, change k, then we can get another form of prime, right? So yeah. So why do we have so in this case? I mean, uh, so a, a prime to be here means what? Yeah, I mean, to prime to be in this uh, arithmetic progression means that if you um, um, okay, so So first of all, to agree that this, these things are inside all primes because we are looking at primes. You give me a prime, okay? I want to show that it's either in PA or or P divides N. I'm saying if P does not divide N, if P does not divide N, then P just just uh, uh, I mean just uh, take the residue of uh, p by uh, yeah by n so you just write p equal to say k n plus alpha right now p is a prime p do, p does not divide n so we get an alpha, which is uh, less than n, beginning equal to one. N. Sorry? Um, 
or n is fixed. So, 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 so I have got a prime, right? So I have, I can write this. Uh, I'm just um, I'm dividing this prime by this number n, and there's going to be some remainder. Uh, okay, so if okay, yeah, so yeah, if p divides n, it's in this finite set. If p doesn't divide n, exactly, but you can still divide it by n, but then there will be some remainder, non-zero remainder. It does not divide n, right? But then it's going to be some alpha. Yeah, but your question is, what is the relation between this alpha and this a? Why, why is it in arithmetic progression? Yes, that's the, that's a good question. So, okay. Six, six, five, seven, six. Also, five. Yeah, so let me see what I need. Yes, so. Sorry. Oh, I just defined f chi to be those um, that do not divide n. Wait, well, what is my definition of f chi? Oh, yeah, yeah. This was not my second test. This is not what, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go right. So I just defined, yeah, sorry. Yeah, because I have two truths of this last statement in mind. I've been struggling to choose between the two, so it was kind of the good point. So yeah, in fact, I defined a phi. Yeah. In fact, I defined a phi. So let me write it like this. In fact, uh, this is my notes from last lecture. A phi s was equal to sum. E does not divide n, right? Pi e over p to the s. That's that's what I that's how I define that pi. Now uh, for pi equal to pi zero, the trivial character. Let's see what the uh, uh, f chi uh, uh, gives us. Then we get f chi zero of s equal to sum. E does not divide n by p. Oh, by p is one, right? Because it's a trivial character. That is one. One over p to the s. And then what I did, I said that, okay, I add p divides n, right? And I subtract it. N. Yes. Good. Now, all these things here gives us all primes. So that's good. Sum over all the primes, p to the s over p. And then there is this finite sum over there. This is a finite sum, right? OK. Now, about all the primes, we proved something. Actually, it was proved by Euler already, as I said, because there's no arithmetic progression, no complication about this A. All primes. So, all primes, when you take, show that sum 1 over p to the s over p is asymptotic to log of 
one over s minus one as s goes to one plus. We prove that. Uh, do you remember how we prove that? That's a good idea to recall that. Do you remember how we proved this? Or how Euler proved that actually? What result about uh, zeta function he used or we used? This is the question. The way we proved it was uh, by using, of course, zeta function, which is sum one over n to the s over n, and the Euler product formula pi one minus one over e to the s minus one over p, and plus so we use some some strong facts. First of all, this is the first one. This is for real part of s bigger than one. Right. And then we use the fact that zeta can be extended left of the line s equal to one and has simple pole at s equal to one. So what we put show that zeta of s is of the form one over s minus one plus pi of s. So this function is homomorphic in real politics bigger than z. This was a bit, this was a really, I mean, it was a tricky proof. So, so as a result, what we managed to do is that we had the zeta function here, first of all. So we pushed its domain, low the line, behind the line, s equal to one. Of course, when one is just to one, it's singularity. This expression shows that Zeta has simple pole at s equal to one. Okay, so we use these two facts, and then how did we prove this as a result? Well, it's close, right? One over s minus one, and here is one over s minus one. <laughs> so you see some so similarities the two statements. We took log on both sides. Yeah, we took log on both sides. Um, exactly. So, log on both sides. We said that log of zeta of s is equal to log of uh, 1 minus p to the s minus 1. And then we expanded this using the uh, geometry, using the power series expansion for log. So this became sum one over, uh, yeah, I mean, K, P to the KS over P and K. But P is all times, K is equals from one to infinity. P is just a prime. Sum. What sum? Oh, here's the sum, of course, yes, yes. Great. And this sum is over all primes. And this is the first one. And interior, each of those terms, we just use our series expansion of log one minus x. Okay, and then we divided it into two pieces. We said that, okay, this is equal to sum over all primes. So k equal to one, one over p to the s, plus some part, shall I call it f of s means P over all primes and over all integers k from two to infinity. And that I said that is less than or equal to one. So this is bounded. There, there's no there's no no issue with that. But this one is now 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 you're there because the thing that you want to estimate is appearing over there, and log of this guy is there. So you just have to argue that log of Zeta of s is log of one s minus one symptotically, and this phi doesn't matter as s goes to. Uh, and then here also you have uh, log of the, you have yeah you have just this term this term. Okay. Okay. 
okay, so it's, it's an elaborate order, right? but it's a very classic order. Okay, used by Euler. Oh, so it, it, that's what everybody tries to imitate and repeat. You're know, just repeating it in a more elaborate way, but that's what it is. Okay. Another question. Yeah, this we did uh, in on the lecture on Friday. Yeah, that's right. Right. So now, um, I mean, we did in. So now, what we have to do, we have to introduce a new function. This function. Uh, a s. equal to one over phi n sum over all characters phi a inverse pi of s so now again where so let me write it again yes where pi of s is sum of um, yeah one over uh, basically yeah pi of p over p to the s p does not divide and we proved something very interesting uh, for this function using orthogonality relation right so. Uh, Formality relations apply to so we we we, we just uh, observe that one over pi n sum pi of a inverse pi p over all characters character sum is equal to What was the result? Do you remember? First, we said that okay, I can write it as sum pi of a inverse of p, right? For all characters, this part. And then we are going down to this is either a inverse of p is equal to one, right? I mean, one to one. In that case, you're summing the value of a character over one. The character of one is one. So, and there are pi of n of them, pi of n characters divided by pi of n, so this is equal to one. So that's one. And if a inverse p e is not the unit of gn, this is zero. You see that, right? Now, but what does this mean? A inverse P. What does that mean? A inverse P equals one means that um, it should be equal to A mod N. That's what it means. So A inverse P mod N. It means that actually p the prime p is equal to a on n it means that p is equal to a plus k n. In other words, this means exactly p should be in the arithmetic program. So this is a very finely tuned object. It's really a characteristic function of the set of primes. That's really an amazing choice. I mean, this is like a magic. So, uh, so I if P belongs to P A. Okay, so this this quantity now is the characteristic function of the set of primes in arithmetic progression in, in our arithmetic. I mean, it's 
spawn in the install. Is um, the function of oh, the set? It takes value one on PA and zero areas. It's kind of distinguishes PA from others. This is a characteristic function. Now, uh, but then what we did, uh, we wrote it in terms of uh, half, right? So let me. So. So let's now. Look at that. So I'm going to erase this part. Is that okay? Should I erase this part? Because I want to focus on the equation. And the observation that the right hand side is the function. It's GSA. Okay. So let's see. So this comes out to some on our EPS. Okay. okay. Now we know that for chi equal, so let's look at this sum for chi equal to chi zero, right? Put the other character f chi zero of s. We know how it behaves, it behaves like log of one over s function, right? It's asymptotic to log of one over s minus one as s goes to one. That's what we prove. And for chi different from chi zero, Well, this f chi s remains bounded as s goes to one. Bounded as. Okay, so now if you look at this sum that you want to understand, so there is one term here which is asymptotic to log of one over s minus one, and there are other terms which are finite that show that this is asymptotic. Let me write this equation star, and I say that so star implies that actually, uh, yes, actually, uh, this thing sum one over p to the s e belonging to pa is asymptotic to log of one over s minus one as this goes to one. Well. Uh, there is this, uh, sorry, there is this uh, one over phi of n. This one over phi of n is there. And for chi equal to chi zero, by the way, this disappears because chi zero of a inverse is one. But this morning I was banging my head and said, oh, well, how can I get rid of this chi of a inverse? I zero. Well, then this is just one, right? <laughs> That's it. So this is the end of it. Maybe it's time to pause and think about this question. See what's going on again. I I I emphasize this. Quantity fact, um, something related to this. That sum is, is, is the essential thing that automatically relation and functionally.
I mean, uh, I see the computer. Are there other nodes? What does he actually do? Well, yeah, exactly. That's, that's what I was going to talk about. And almost nothing is known. Oh, yeah. See, okay. my, 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 my advice to you is that any of the mathematics see, don't be happy learning going in. You should always think about how I can. So the question you should always ask is how I can generalize this. What's the next step? What's the, what's the extension of this? Design? And in this case, what possible extensions you would place? Uh, how would you think about generalizing? You are a mathematician, you want to generalize that. That's your task. You have to generalize. That's what mathematicians do all the time. Uh, so, how would you generalize the theorem? That's the question. How would you generalize it? You want to write a research proposal uh, with, with, with saying, okay, I plan to spend my next year using uh, the money you're giving me to do that, spending some time for this problem. Or how would you? So. Sorry? What is obviously for the application? Not necessarily. It was KN. So, of what form then? Yeah, I mean, so uh, then usually we are, we are talking about some sequences of numbers that have a potential of having primes in them. Of course, if you pick a sequence that definitely manifestly doesn't have any prime, it's just a. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's, yes. it's, it would be a no brainer, right? But you want to choose some. Huh? Yeah, but, but uh, so, yeah, but uh, that would be maybe about different proofs. What I, what I have in mind, and uh, also others, is that. We can think about other sequences. For example, so one possible question is, are there infinite primes in the sequence and square plus one? So you see, we are going from linear to quadratic. That's um, always something. You go from linear to quadratic, to non-linear. Then nothing can stop you. You can go from quadratic to quartic. Basically, any polynomial you can open. All of them are open. So basically, nobody knows what this is showing. Uh, any function that is physical nature, oh, yeah. as yeah, exactly. As long as it's not obviously non-prime, you can conditions, for example, then you're in the unknown territory, and you're uh, this, you have you have a proposal, you have a research research problem. Of course, they may tell you that you have tried this for. 200 years, well, after Dirichlet, Dirichlet tried this, I guess, this problem. After the 50 years, they haven't made any progress, or some progress, but how can you convince us that you are the person that I can give you the money, taxpayers' money, to spend one year solving this problem, instead of having good time in Paris or New York or somewhere? <laughs> how would you convince your benefactors? Granting agencies, well, perhaps have some ideas, oh, but that's that's the way that's the way mathematics is today. You don't know this, and QB quarterly, yeah, well, that's one possibility. Can we think of other possibilities? Huh? You change the constant also. Change something like n2 plus linear term plus zero order. 
this kind of thing, same kind of ideas, you can take a lot of things for the case. Um, is there, are there any other things? Uh, yeah. Like these L functions uh, that usually are special. That has to to actually study L functions for not uh, A also are related to some very interesting numbers. Are we okay question? Okay. Now, one thing I want to do before we um, think of it was um, tell you that, for example, so here is a statement, order of primes and, I mean, if you write it, digit and with one, There is a one at the, the last digit, quarter of primes, and with B, quarter of primes with seven, quarter of primes. Oh, but not more than four. <laughs> one, two, three, four. <laughs> so, <laughs> because that was just <laughs> one of primes ends with end with nine. In the this one, uh, in the middle of nine. That's kind of nice, right? Because so if you have if, if you pick a prime at random. Someone asked, what are the chances of having the right uh, constituted one? You should bet on four. And what about <clears throat> three again for You should not uh, wage uh, differently. You should wage for And what is the reason? Uh, I want to do that. Exactly. So, in fact, we just let n be equal to 10 and a equal to 1, or we can take a equal to 3, or a equal to 7, or a equal to 9. Any prime is in one of these arithmetic progressions, so you plus k ends. Because after you're dividing your uh, prime by 10, you have to get some number. It's going to be one of these possibilities because you cannot get something that it would be non co prime. Okay. See, it can't be two. It's not a prime. Oh, you mean this number two? Yeah, number two is just, it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> It doesn't make any difference because there are infinite number of primes. And, yeah, but that's a good point. What about five? Five, where are five here? Five is a equal to zero would be five. It's in this list. Is it five? Oh, is that five, oh no. five also. The measure is zero. Yeah, yeah, the measure is zero. Yeah, there's just only one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that the only thing that you Seven also. Seven or seven. Oh, yeah. I think that's it because everything. So, why, 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 Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyhow, so those cases we can just neglect because they have major zero or quality zero, whatever. I don't know. And then the, you know, there is something here, though. I mean, 
Well, I mean, this is some statement about the infinite sets. And the measure of uh, comparing these things was to this military density. We didn't have other densities, which would be the density is not a density that you want to go on out and you know say that okay, what is the density of you know just like uh, I don't know, I mean uh, people of uh, income over hundred thousand all population compared to all that's not what you should call it. It's a decision competition. Just use ratios simply. And the even in analog of ratio would be to take ratios of finite parts and then let that go to that's not what we are doing here. We are using the density. This sense that's my probability measure. Okay, so that's here. Like, like, let's say you had progressions, maybe you could pick a different, uh, different, um, different measure for comparing sets. Basically, we want to compare it with sets, right? Right, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know really. There may be other, other measures, perhaps. Yeah, something because it's kind of related to what we're doing also. So yeah, different measure the spectral uh, yeah. yeah, so yeah, we, we couldn't investigate that. I don't know. I feel like the, the, the nice thing is the log. Yeah, this is that's and that that's the driving that it's something else. Maybe you have it. Sorry. I mean, the most, again, the most natural thing would be to study this limit. Limit of number of P belonging to PA such that P is less than or equal to K or, or, or X, right? Primes that are in PA divided by primes that are all primes less than or equal to X. As X goes to infinity. Yes, you're kind of but but you know what this is actually. You know what this number is. So let, let me. Uh, is that what what you would you say? I was gonna say it's kind of like uh, some kind of like test of regularizing yeah. a limit. Yeah, we are regularizing exactly. We are kind of test one. So let, let's look at this number of primes. Less than, so I'm going to simply write it as number of primes less than equal. Well, this is a famous function I I, I talked about this lecture. Right? Well, x. And we know that what is the asymptotic of that? This is x over log x, right? As x goes to infinity. So, what are the number of primes in Ta? Uh, would be nice to have to have a estimate like this actually. I don't know if this is known or not. Or unknown. Is this thing called Chebotarov density theorem? So maybe I mean I know that's a generalization of uh, this thing. Uh, this, uh, uh, density theorem, but uh, in general number fields. To uh, window of integers of general number fields that we can, can do that. But I don't know if this is the, the uh, in, in Chabotaro, they use the same measure or it's a different measure they use. Do they use like this one over P to the S again or? Yeah, this is something, this is one of the important, but okay, we can discuss that. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. So, so essentially, it's like one over P to the S. So we don't get. A, I mean, what 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 worries me is that why we don't have a nice prime number theorem for primes in arithmetic progression. 
but it should have a prime number for primes in other Dogs? I don't know. If we have that, because we know this estimate for the denominator, yeah. if you have that estimate, then we could have this. We need this is the answer that this actual density because that this we always have this quantity if it exists, the natural density. And it's, it's obvious then why it's called natural, because it is natural. That's what humans would use compared to sets, finite or infinite, doesn't matter. Not this one. One would have given this a strange. But uh, I don't know. And then this limit is not known, right? This limit, I don't think it's not But don't trust me. Okay. You have you have to you have to you have to take what I say with grain of salt. You have to uh, study it as well. That's sort of evidentially, yeah, sort of, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so some evidence for the state. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Right. Okay, now we can just, uh, for now, at least put this delicious theorem aside, and I want to do something else, which is related. I mean, it's kind of continuation of what I'm doing. So this is about, uh, so chapter two, basically, analytic continuation. And functional equation of data function. Okay, so let's recall data function is this. Originally was defined for real part of S given part, right? Originally was defined by Riemann and uh, following Euler uh, for all complex numbers, real part of S given one. And uh, this is holomorphic there, right? This was the first step. And then what we did uh, in this lecture so far, extended this to Line real part of s bigger than zero except s equal to one. So we saw that zeta of s equal to one over s minus one plus part of s. So the original domain was here, open right half plane, and then we extended it to open right half plane. Take away the singularity s equal to one. Right. Now the question is, what can we do with uh, this region? Question is, is there a continuation? Data. To real part of S. That's, that's that's the question. So look at this function one over n to the S. Of course, this is this expansion only valid for the other part of the speaker than one. This function diverges potentially in real part of S less than one. That's definitely. On the critical line, S not critical line, S equal to one. Okay. So it's got certainly here. And now, but the thing is, so this shows that this is statement two shows that 
there is an article in the mission all the way up there, but we don't know what's going on on this line and below this line. So this is really behind, uh, you know, it's like kind of thick characters. What is going on? So, um, it's a good idea for you if you want to really follow and understand what think about as you are going to think about the idea of analytic today. Think about it. some examples. You have to show some simple examples. Analytic mm -hmm. Some examples where analytic continuation is not obvious, and things like that. So this is very very important issue. Analytic continuation. That possible only tends to complex analysis. So. Uh, to prepare for this, we need uh, to introduce. Okay, so first of all, there are different methods to this to achieve extension less than zero. The method that I'm going to use is a very classic method that will be so um, for that very useful and it's used in many of the contexts. So, but for that, you need something called the uh, demo function. So, this is uh, a gamma man, yeah. But yeah, indeed, I love gamma function too because I think we love gamma function able to. To get here in mathematics, definitely not. It's just such an important thing. It really does magic. It's like number e or number pi or log or this so as important as those concepts. I mean, without you will see that this gamma function is looks like magic. So uh, gamma function, yes. Yes. Um, yes, if uh, you have a domain open set and you have a bigger open set such that the floating is connected, with the open set is also connected, and uh, the only continuation is unique. This follows from some simple, simple continuity analysis. You know, it's called identity. We I mean, have a holomorphic function that, say, vanishes on a set, on just a discrete set that has a limit point, then that's uh, zero. Very powerful theorem. Don't have it among C. Only holomorphic. It's a unique zeroism. Uh, Analytic condition to manage to extend. Analytically, okay. In the domain that you are. So the, the tenth, but is it also applicable to this analytic extending state of factor zero? Yes, that's, that's what that's what it is used. used. Yeah. That's, that's exactly what is used. Exactly. Yes. Okay. So, okay, so, um, so what is gamma function? So, definition. First of all, for real part of S bigger than zero, that gamma of s by definition equal to integral from zero to infinity e to the minus t e to the s over t dt. So this is uh, the thing that have. Uh, well, okay, so the first thing is why this integral even is convergent, right? So why convergent? There are two issues at infinity for any integral that extends to infinity, and there is also zero. 
Okay, why why is it convergent at infinity? Yeah, exactly. At infinity, this is like a polynomial of order s minus one for any s actually. And so this is exponential. No, that's not a stupid question. That's a very good question. I write t to the s over t because t over t is the multiplicative measure of the positive real axis. So the measure secretly is not the vague measure, it's dt over t measure. But I can write t to the s minus one, but I will never ever write t to the s minus one. I, say, I, I just get sick if I write to the s minus one. For me, it's always t to the s, t to the s. It's over t. I always wondered why, but I just didn't. It's over t. over t is the measure for me. Oh, that's a good one. So, why conversion? At infinity, okay then? At zero. Why is it converging at zero? So we can forget about e to the minus t because that's well behaved at zero, right? But what about so now we want to say that for example integral from zero to one and we just divide it into two pieces and t to the s over t dt is less than infinite. And for that, I'll just show that it's absolutely it's absolutely convergent. So what is uh, so to one absolute value of t to the s over t dt. But if you just write, we are talking about s equal to x plus i y, right? Where x is positive. So I want to look at what is the absolute value of t to the s. This absolute value of t to the x plus i y. What is that? Sorry? It's just the modulus, t to the x, right? So this is just t to the x. Okay, so then your integral is down to integral t to the x over t is zero to one dt. And remember, x is positive, right? So, okay, I'm now having to write one minus x, t to the x minus one dt. And uh, now, what is that? That's just, uh, uh, what is this? Uh, okay. Just need to do x over x, right? From zero to one. So this becomes one over x, but zero to the x power, positive power is zero. Zero? Oh, no, no, no. T is a dummy value. Forget it. S. Oh, no, no, no. T, T. S is, the, is, S is fixed. T. Because we are integrating against T. So we have to worry about T to be zero and T to be Uh, so you see, I have an integral. I want to define an integral like this. So I have to show that near zero, this is convergent. So I just write it as integral from zero to one, so it's integral one to infinity, dt, whatever. And then at this, we show that is okay. And now this part, we have to worry about and uh, by this estimate, this is okay. But now, 
this something interesting happens. Notice that this is actually now divergent for real part of S less than or equal to C. This integral is divergent. So doesn't work. The formula doesn't work. Okay. So we have that. Now, uh, so, and uh, this function by general results is for the more So let me write it down. So gamma of S. Which is so far integral from zero to minus t t to the x over t dt urgent, and I say holomorphic. Um, you have to worry about why this is holomorphic. So that's the kind of issue you have to worry about homomorphicity. Um, well, I mean, first of all, so here is the situation. We have this. We have a two-parameter family of function, T and S. In S, it is holomorphic. Because this function, as a function of S, is holomorphic. It's holomorphic. Because why is it holomorphic? You can write T to the S as T to the X plus IY, right? And then you can write it as E to the X plus IY times uh, log T. So, I mean, this is S. Which is like e to the s log e. Function in s is holomorphic. Uh, is that enough to guarantee that this is uh, holomorphic? So we are integrating family of holomorphic functions, and we want to say that the, the result is holomorphic. The equation is like sum. We are summing family, is summing. Finite number of holomorphic functions. Sum is always holomorphic. But if you sum, is what this integration is like infinite summation. If you want to make sure that sum of infinite holomorphic functions is infinite, you have to make sure that you have convergence on uh, compact, uniform convergence on compact subsets. Okay. So again, you have to prove this sort of results on analysis. So let's say that. Is holomorphic S provided that TS is holomorphic in S and the integral is uniformly convergent on compact subsets of. So I'm not giving a full answer to the, I just raised the question and I'm not uh, answering completely, but I'm saying that something you have to investigate to so you read some stuff. I mean, just go online and find something. I mean, there are books and come. But this sort of integrals, you have to make sure that they are holding on. There is a, there's a minor issue. You have to be. Confident. 
they're all more complex um, setting. Mm -hmm. And then the limit is also extending. That could be, yeah, 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 yeah that's right. Thank you. And that could be a strategy. I mean, this is not a terribly difficult thing. It's not a standard okay. argument. I wasn't sure if it was. No, no, no. It's not, but there is an issue. Right? So yeah, yeah. Let's just be, be aware that, okay, we are, we are going to assume that, okay, so this gamma function is polymorphic, the part of S bigger than zero. And the definition certainly does not extend the part of S equal to zero or less than zero. So far. Okay. Now, next thing is uh, I want to uh, write a functional equation for zeta uh, for for gamma. Sorry. Oops. Okay. So this is now functional equation for gamma. Gamma has have the following relation gamma of plus one is equal to S gamma S for real part of S. This equation holds for all S a part of the speaker. That's called functional equation for gamma. How do we prove it? So gamma of s is equal to well uh, originally, so gamma of s plus one, let's write it, is equal to and equals zero to minus t t to the s plus one divided by t dt. Okay, so this is equal to, so let me just write it as t to the s dt now, at least. <laughs> right, so how can we relate gamma of s plus one gamma of s? Huh? Integration by parts? Integration by parts, yeah. So would be do that that would be u that would be u and this would be t v right i would think so yeah so this is okay so let's write it and this is equal to u v who is t to the s anyhow and t is minus to the minus t from zero to infinity sorry minus and there is a minus sign here, plus integral from zero to infinity, b d u. So b, uh, so this one, and we use s t to the s minus one, s t to the s minus one, e to the minus t. Okay, this guy at infinity is zero, and at zero is also zero. All of this is positive. It's like it's positive. Zero, this S is out, so this is S. So that, so that works like uh, very nicely. Now, what is gamma of one? What is gamma of one? We want to compute gamma of one, we know that this is equal to integral from zero to infinity e to the minus t, t over t, dt, right? So gamma of one is equal to one, right? <laughs> gamma of one is one, one, first of all. And second of all, I'm saying gamma of n is equal to n minus one factorial. For all n bigger than or equal to zero, for all n bigger than. That's kind of kind of gives you a hint what gamma 
strong, two gamma is strong, right? General formula for factorial, but standing factorial is more complex number. So let us prove this. Well, I mean, for n equal to zero, I cannot write say gamma of n plus one equal to n factorial. I'm going to write it. Why? Okay, for n equal to zero, we verify it. Right? And uh, in general, it follows from functional equation. Then, functional equation implies that gamma of n plus one is equal to n gamma of n by induction hypothesis this is n n minus one factorial so this is n factorial right so that's nice so let's look at how gamma function looks like actually graph of gamma function for uh fields we cannot think of graphs let's forget it the headache, I think it will be <laughs> as over the complex uh, domain, but at least for real, we can try to draw its graph and almost it's like this. This is S. Okay, as S goes to zero, this goes to infinity. At one, we you know that it is. Uh, one. Now, honestly, uh, I don't know where the minimum of this function is. Is it past one or before one? I, I, I'm not sure. So, but then it just goes to infinity really fast because at two is, I think, C. Yeah, it's coming down here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so so yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just yeah. So the minimum is between one and two. Because at two takes value one, right? And at one also takes value. And uh, this function is actually one. Um, how to it's even stronger, it's long Yeah, but I mean, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> it is long, but, but it is convex. It is convex. You agree that it is convex? This is called convex, right? This is I always forget the uh, calculus classes, you convex or concave. Then there is there are these calculus books from convex up, down, or... <laughs> so why, why don't we just use one term, convex? Okay, this is convex, right? I think convex means that actually gamma double prime of S is really positive. Second derivative is positive for uh, real part, for S real. If you prove this, which you can, because you just then uh, I believe the minimum is going to be something. Uh, okay. So rapidly, so you can convince yourself why this is rapidly going here and why just uh, I mean having this sort of thing and convexity it shows that it's just pushing up all very quickly on that. Uh, what uh, what what the cheap information we Um, yeah, one of the things is gamma pass is morally minus gamma pass, yeah, minus pass factorial. Gamma pass minus half factorial. Pass. It 
Yeah, there is a root pi there. I know. Well, let's complete our path. Well, this is integral from zero to infinity, right? So minus t. And then I've got t to the half over t, right? So it becomes t to the power what? Minus half, right? So now, uh, how can we relate this to Gaussian integral? Let's let's make it so. So what what I'm talking? About? Put uh, t to the u square. Then the negative is negative. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. T to the minus t is equal to minus. Then the negative. Yeah. Yeah. Um. That's that's the one we have to calculate. Yeah, yeah, that's so yeah, let's see. I I I I, I want to relate it to uh okay, so by okay, but this, I know that this is t to the gamma of three over two. No, no. So what is gamma of three over two? Yeah, let's try this. So if you make a substitution, there's that term to make the D T term. For the EU. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That that might that might help. That's right. So in, in fact, so let's uh, okay. So we are saying let t be equal to u square, right? And then dt is equal to two u du, right? So then uh, the integral becomes yeah, integral zero to infinity e to the minus u squared. And then uh, two minus one, yeah, and two into du. Okay, they sweetly cancel each other. So this is uh, equal to twice integral. So this is equal to twice integral zero to infinity into minus. To okay, anyone knows this? This is what the your insurance broker did in his computer. Yeah, they use this normal and computing the your premium. The start and everything physics. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I want to use the following fact. So this I won't compute for you. I just write it minus infinity plus infinity, the power minus one half a squared dx is equal to root two pi over a. That I won't use. Okay, so this is equal to then integral from minus infinity plus infinity to minus u squared to u, right? Now, so you can use this, so just pick A equal to two then, right? So this is equal to the two pi over two, two pi. So yeah, so gamma of this is root pi. So by the same token, you have gamma of n plus half. So it's kind of fun to play with gamma of n plus half. What is gamma of n plus half? The formula was gamma of s equal to s gamma of s minus one, right? So this is equal to n plus half gamma of n minus half, right? So this is equal to then n plus half and minus half and so on. So you go all the way up to half. Oh, gamma of half, sorry. And then this is, uh, 
And I believe there are no other values of gamma that you can fit explicitly. These are the only ones, and the trivial that you can do with this part. There's no other value. I mean, it's maybe of uh, no number about, I mean, of course. No, like, of no, yeah, yeah, I don't wow. think so. Okay, that's kind of uh, interesting. Uh, but uh, yeah, so yeah, I mean, uh, there is a very nice book written by Emil Arkin about the gamma function. The classic uh, is about 60 with lots of. And also, in one some sense, it is the unique extension of factorial function, all uh, real s bigger than zero, and um, uh, such that uh, um, it's convex and smooth and some other conditions. So this was introduced by Euler. So Euler gives he gave several definitions of uh, yeah. What we want to do now is uh, extend gamma to the whole complex plane. We want to extend gamma to the whole complex plane. So let me write this down. And I will finish there as quickly. Okay, so why don't I do this actually on uh, next week? So next week, I think. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of at least having one extra session over for the because we still have one over. Can I have one extra session? I will do one more session. Thank you.